DeepSeek has announced the R1 model and in the abstract they clearly mention that they have open source DeepSeek R10 and DeepSeek R1 which are the two models that they are releasing as part of this DeepSeek R1 release and if we visit their website says that DeepSeek R1 is now live and open source rivaling OpenAI's model O1. So it's the first time an open source model is directly rivaling an OpenAI's O1 model and if we click on that link, it leads us to their announcement, which is the DeepSeek R1 release. And again, right on top, they say that the performance is on par with OpenAI's O1. And it's a fully open source model. And they've also released the technical report. And they have also distilled a couple of models on the DeepSeek. And it's again under MIT license. And they are completely free. And they've given the link for us to try out DeepSeek. If we click on that link, it opens up this page. I played around with it quickly and the first impression is that there is a DeepThink R1 link so we can either activate or deactivate the DeepSeek R1 model by just clicking on this. And a nice little addition is that there's also a search functionality. We can enable or disable it. So with the search disable, if we ask what's the weather like in London today, it clearly says that it was last updated July 2024 and doesn't have real time data access including the current weather conditions but it is asking us to access Met Office or BBC weather or use any other app on the smartphone but if we have it enabled and ask the same question it is searching the web and says that today January 27 2025 the weather is like you know and it goes on and on giving us the real-time update on the weather so when we are using the chat we can readily enable it and then ask any question that we think will need access to the internet so with that introduction let's quickly jump into the paper and have a look at what they are proposing and how they have designed the model so the title of the paper is incentivizing reasoning capability in LLMs via reinforcement learning. So the key element is reinforcement learning and they're introducing two models, namely DeepSeq R10 and DeepSeq R1. And they are saying that, that the model is trained via large scale reinforcement learning without supervised fine tuning. So they are completely eliminating the supervised fine tuning step which is one of the key steps when you want to train these LLMs. So basically, if we look at how we typically train a large language model, we typically do a free training where we feed a huge amount of data, usually uh, web scale data. We pull all the data from the web and then create a pre-trained model. And that goes through a supervised fine tuning because the model at this stage is trained mainly for sequence prediction. But the next stage, we wanted to actually follow instruction where we kind of chat with it, where a user provides some form of instruction and the model executes that instruction. So in order to achieve that, we need to do supervised fine tuning. And usually we go ahead doing some reinforcement learning with human feedback. And more recently, they started doing reinforcement learning with AI feedback because the models were falling behind the OpenAI model. They were able to do AI feedback using the OpenAI model. And we do reinforcement learning from the feedback that we get from this model. But what what this paper is now saying is that we can completely eliminate this step. We don't have to go through supervised fine tuning. We will just typically go from pre-training to reinforcement learning with human feedback or some other element of reinforcement learning as we will see later on in the video. And they have given this plot right at the beginning of the paper in the first page, which compares the DeepSeq R1 and the uh, DeepSeq R1 variation, which is DeepSeq R1 32 billion parameters with the OpenAI. AI O1 and OpenAI O1 Mini and their predecessor, which is DeepSeq V3. And we can clearly see that in quite a few tasks now, we can see the DeepSeq R1 performs better than OpenAI, or if not on par with it, for example, in the AI ME 2024 task, we can see that DeepSeq R1 is at 79.8, but OpenAI is only at 79.2. 
Similarly, there are tasks like Math 500, for example, in case of math reasoning, and we can see that DeepSeq R1 is now better than OpenAI, which is just at 96.4. But there are tasks where OpenAI still leads, for example, in the MMLU task, we can see that OpenAI is at 91.8, but the DeepSeq R1 is just at 90.8 but it's getting pretty close and like they have mentioned it's quite competitive and comparable to the OpenAI O1 model so let's get into what goes on with the reinforcement learning so in terms of the training approach they have proposed two models obviously uh, which is DeepSeq R10 and DeepSeq R1 and they train both of them differently for example, for the DeepSeq R10, they apply reinforcement learning directly without any supervised fine tuning. But when it comes to DeepSeq R1, they apply reinforcement learning starting from a fine tuned checkpoint, and the supervised fine tuning is done with thousands of chain of thought examples and they also distill the reasoning model from DeepSeq R1 to small dense models. Later on we will see that they are doing this uh, distillation on a couple of models which is LAMA and the Quen model but let's look into what this reinforcement learning on the base model is all about. For the reinforcement learning they are using group relative policy optimization or GRPO which was proposed in this paper in 2024 and GRPO seems to be a variation of proximal policy optimization which is PPO. So the main reason for going for GRPO is to save the training cost associated with reinforcement learning. So to understand GRPO we first need to look into PPO and then move on to GRPO. So let's start with PPO. So in case of proximal policy optimization we can see that we input a question and it goes through the policy model and the policy model gives us the output and on top of that we have all these models which are the reference model reward model and the value model so as we can see here as they've shown the trainable models or these three models which are the value model and the policy model so the output of the value model coupled with the reward that we are getting from the different outputs that we get here are passed through the generalized advantage estimation algorithm to calculate the advantage. So the advantage is nothing but a measure of how good this output is relative to this policy. So if the policy is updated and the output is better, then we'll have a better advantage. So this is the very high level overview of PPO. The biggest problem with this is that as we can see, there is one model here, which is a trained model or it's got parameters to be trained. And there's also another model here, which is the value model that also needs to be trained. And this turns out to be quite computationally expensive. In order to overcome that we need to use GRPO. In this case we will have a policy model but we are getting rid of this value model altogether. So without the value model what we are doing is we get a bunch of outputs here instead of just getting one output here and we pass the entire group output or the bunch of outputs to the reference model and the reward model and we get a bunch of rewards actually and we are then doing group computation in order to get a bunch of advantages. So this way we are eliminating the need for a value model and this is a improvement over PPO and this is what's been used for reinforcement learning in the proposed paper. So this reward that we are getting here is directly proportional to the advantage because it's just the group computation process that maps this one to this one and the advantage in turn controls the policy of the training so which means that you know we need to design a good reward system in order to have a better policy model and that's what exactly they're doing in the paper it consists of the accuracy reward and also the format reward so how have they designed this reward model for that they have used the rule based reward system for example they have based it on the accuracy. Let's say the model is dealing with a math problem. Then we can say that, you know, we need the output answer in a specified format or a specific value. And if the model doesn't give that specified format or the value, then we can say the model got it wrong. 
and it's a very deterministic result. Similarly, if it's a lead code problem, obviously we can put it through a compiler and find out if the program runs and if it passes a set of test cases and only if it passes all the test cases, then we can say that the generated output is right. Similarly, they've also introduced a format reward. It's nothing but putting this tag, which is the thing tag, and they have inspected the thinking process of the model. For example, we can look into this template, which is conversation between user and assistant, and the user asks a question and the assistant solves it. And the assistant first thinks about the reasoning process in the mind and then provides the user with the answer. The reasoning process and the answer are enclosed within the thing tags and the answer tags, respectively. And the reasoning process needs to be within this thing tag. And what Whatever the prompt is from the user goes in the user colon prompt and the response from the assistant or the model comes here. So this is the template that they have used. So with that reward model set and also the training template that we've just seen, let's see how the training progresses. So they have shown the training performance using the reinforcement learning training process in figure two, which is this one. Here they have compared the training progress to that of OpenAI's O1 model and they have used a sample response of 16. As we can see that as the training progresses, the accuracy of the system gradually improves and at some point the R1 model surpasses the baseline which is this green line and it corresponds to the O1 model at pass one so clearly it surpasses that and then there is a stage when it also surpasses the oven model so they are saying that DeepSeq R10 demonstrate steady and consistent enhancement in performance as the reinforcement learning training advances. It's an evidence to the efficacy of uh, reinforcement learning in optimizing the model performance over time. So basically we can skip the supervised fine tuning step and we can focus more on reinforcement learning directly, which seems to be quite efficient. And they've gone one more step to evaluate the self-evolution process. And they have given a plot, which indicates that, you know, as the training progresses along the x-axis, we can see that the average length of the response increases, indicating that the model is taking time to think and generates longer responses, explaining itself or doing more of a self-evolution if you like, in order to express itself, its reasoning ability. So this way of training also improves the reasoning ability, which is the main intention of the paper. But during testing, they seem to have also noticed some remarkable aspects of self-evolution, which is the emergence of sophisticated behaviors at test time. And this is things like self-reflection, where the model actually revisits its response and then kind of correct itself. So this is what they are calling it the aha moment of the DeepSeq R10 model. Let's have a look at the example that they have given for this one. They've given this example where it tries to solve this equation and it goes on to solve it and suddenly it prints wait, 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 there's an aha moment I can flag here. And then it re-evaluates it step by step to identify if the correct sum can be, can be calculated. So it starts with the equation again. So we can see that it started with this equation and it goes back to that equation again, recomputes it and then self-corrects itself. So which is a quite an interesting trait. They're saying that it is witnessed by the power and beauty of reinforcement learning. So the paper totally supports reinforcement learning and tries to convey us that that's the way ahead when we want to try in the LLMs. So though the model seems to be quite good at reasoning, it seems to have some drawbacks. For example, it seems to have challenges like poor readability and also language mixing. So language mixing is one of the main reasons they are motivated to do this uh, DeepSeq R1 model. So let's find out how they train this DeepSeq R1 over the R10 model. So with those drawbacks in mind, let's move on to DeepSeq R1 and see if the training process for DeepSeq R1 addresses these drawbacks, which is the language mixing. So for the DeepSeq R1, they follow a four-stage training process. First stage is the cold start, where they collect a small amount of chain of thought data to fine-tune the model as the reinforcement learning actor. 
Like we know that PPO is one of those algorithms, which is more of a actor critic algorithm. So we'll have to employ an actor for that. They are collecting some fine tuning data. They collected thousands of cold start fine tuning data and they fine tuned the DeepSeq V3 base model, which is their predecessor which was released before this. So they are using that as the base and they are using that as the starting point for the reinforcement learning. And in the next stage, they are doing reasoning oriented reinforcement learning. So they apply the same large scale reinforcement learning training process that we saw for the R10 model, but they are they observe that the chain of thought often exhibits language mixing. So that was one of the drawbacks when they mentioned about R10. In order to mitigate this uh, language mixing problem, they introduce language consistency reward during the reinforcement learning process. So initially we saw that the reward that they were using were deterministic rewards. They were using accuracy and the format reward. Now they are going one step ahead and saying that we just don't want these uh, rewards alone, but we want to include other rewards. And those rewards are that of the uh, consistency reward. So combining this consistency reward along with those two rewards that we saw seems to be the second stage for the reasoning oriented reinforcement learning. And in the third step, they are doing a rejection sampling. So for this stage, they incorporate data from other domains to enhance the model's capabilities in say writing or role playing or in you know, other general purpose task. So they're kind of expanding the repertoire of possibilities by the model. And they're also including the reasoning data. They're expanding the data set by incorporating additional data for some of which are a generative reward model, for instance. And they have gathered 600,000 reasoning related training samples and they go ahead and also include non-reasoning data and for the non-reasoning data you know they want to gather data for example writing or factual question answering or translation and they include 200,000 training samples in the training and they mix everything up and train in that stage and the last one is the reinforcement learning for all scenarios so they implemented a secondary reinforcement learning training stage and you know they train the model using combination of reward signal and also diverse prompt distribution so combining the reward signal and diverse prompt distribution they follow the same procedure that we followed for deepseq r10 and then they build on top of the deepseq v3 pipeline and they train at this stage and lastly they do some distillation to empower small models in this case it's the quen model and the llama model for example they have chosen the base model quen 2.5 math 1.5 billion parameter model the math 7 billion parameter model and 14 billion parameter model and in case of llama they've gone for llama 3.1 8 billion and llama 3.3 70 billion in stock and for the distillation they apply supervised fine tuning and do not include any reinforcement learning stage and the good news is that all these models are open source and they are available for us to play around with. Let's move on to the evaluations and find out what they have done with the experiments. So this is the uh, results that they have presented. They have compared it with Cloud 3.5 Sonnet, GPT-40 and OpenAI O1 Mini. And we can see that the DeepSeq R1 seems to be the best out of the uh, these models in a few of the tasks. For example, in terms of English, we can see that it, it seems to do a pretty good job here and also over here. And in case of coding though, you can see that Cloud 3.5 leads when it comes to SWE verified. When it comes to code forces, OpenAI 01 seems to be still a leader. And in case of live code bench, the DeepSeq model seems to be better, but there's no beating the uh, math reasoning anymore because it's DeepSeq R1 seems to be the best of all of the models. And in case of Chinese as well, DeepSeq R1 seems to be better compared to all of the others. This is a broad evaluation of the model. On top of that, they've also presented some of the distillation model evaluations. And for the distill model, of course, we have the Quen and the Llama models. And we can see that the distill models do a pretty good job compared to the other ones, given that they are small sized models so with that we are wrapping up our review of this paper i hope to see you in my next video until then take care